Mr. Michael Shimamoto, and Alberto Antonio for the opening prayer. Please, Mr. Messi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Randy Bosch. 
1988, he received his PhD in computer science, and in 2006, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. As a science professor, who had childhood dreams of going to space, he, on one fateful day of 2007, bravely stepped into an audience of 400. Remember these, it's like 800, but you get, you get the point. <laughs> and delivered a last lecture, which slides with the CT scan. He was described as funny and invincible when he did this. He lost his battle to cancer the following year. But his lecture was so phenomenal that even after his life here on Earth, he will certainly be continued to be remembered. He lives through his lectures. He lives through his books. That's his book. He has a picture of a rocket because he really likes going to space, but he never got to go to space. It's a really nice rocket. Rocket, rocket, rocket. <laughs> <laughs> the point is we remember. We carry what our teachers give to us throughout our lives. If that were not true, this room wouldn't be filled. My friends, without any further ado, please allow me to introduce the speaker for today. Bimbalet. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the speaker, an educator loved by all, is someone who teaches undergraduate theology at the Ateneo de Manila University. Specifically, Theo 131, marriage, family life, and human sexuality in a Catholic perspective. He formally entered the Society of Jesus in 1977 and was ordained in March 5, 1983. <laughs> he received his doctorate in canon law and marriage from the top Rand University for the ecclesiastical faculties in the world, the Gregorian University in Rome, a university which has produced more than 70 saints and blessed, and where eight of the last 11 popes have taught. Still not impressed, he defended his thesis in Latin, a man can speak Latin. <laughs> <laughs> he is also an author, the author of three books, Sacrament of Initiation, Canon Law and Marriage, and The Marriage Contract. At present, he serves as a judge in the ecclesiastical tribunals of Manila, Pasig, Antipolo, Palo, Rumblon, and Lucena. It's a lot. <laughs> He is an established church lawyer, apart from being the Jesuit we all know and love. Today, after 25 years of teaching, I want to thank all of you for being a part of Ateneo history, because he will give his first lecture for the first time after turning it down so many times. <laughs> Friends, please welcome with a round warm of applause one of the greatest educators in the generation, and personally one of my favorite professors, Father Adolfo Tahane. company did, but I've been getting questions, some out of curiosity, others I believe of relief. This is your last lecture? <laughs> you mean you are retiring? <laughs> you can almost hear the subtext, finally. <laughs> I would like to uh, put this in a little context. I, when I was preparing this, I really thought what I would say if I were to, if I were to know that I will be dying soon, what would I say? You know, I have a program in my life. I say I will be 60 this year, and I think I will. My program is I will die at 70. I have 10 more years to uh, go. And uh, if this were 10 years in the future, I suppose this is one 
of the things I would like to uh, say. <laughs> life lessons, things I would have done differently, things I am thankful for, <laughs> and like a well-rounded talk, some kind of a conclusion. Of course, life lessons and uh, realization. Being free in 9 March of 1983, my first assignment was to a small little parish in Titay in Sambuanga del Sur, a town of about 4,000 people, most of whom were Catholics. The only road was north-south, Ipil, from Ipil to Dipolog. The usual means of transportation was by foot or by horse. Yes, I did ride a horse, <laughs> though I would not qualify as an equestrian. But most of the time I visited the 43 barrio chapels, mostly on foot. Some chapels were two hours away on foot, others were three days. In the town of Pitay, there was no electricity in my first five months. Obviously there was no TV, no internet. We didn't even have a refrigerator. We went to bed at 7.30. I had to preach in, I had to learn Cebuano, I had to preach in Cebuano. Life was physically difficult, and of course I was daunted and intimidated. But I went, mainly out of obedience. But I was pleasantly surprised that it was not all that difficult. I took life one step at a time. I realized that it was not all that daunting. I realized, as President Roosevelt said, I had nothing to fear but fear itself. Now, why am I rambling around about my first assignment as a priest? I think we are made of sterner stuff than we think. We overestimate the difficulties. We are paralyzed by the possible risks. I think we are more resilient than we think. We overprotect ourselves and the people we love, and we think we are doing them a favor. When it is your turn to become parents, though I hope this will not be any time soon, <laughs> do not create a sterilized and germ-free environment for your children. Some germ here, a little pain there, occasional disappointment, will not nuke them out of existence. Difficulties build character. One point two. <laughs> Whenever I get the chance to bring this point to my class, I always try to do it, and if possible, with some drama. I say that a daily routine saves us a lot of time. We do not have to decide whether we should shit, shower, shave, shave, shit, and shower. <laughs> If there's a routine which saves us a lot of effort and time. This is also an empirical validation of what you can almost guess O'Neill and Black say <laughs> about virtues. There are good habits, good routines, stable dispositions to do the good. 
Now I'm about to plagiarize. Larry Bird, the famous Boston Celtics basketball player, could not miss a free throw even if it was called for by the script of a TV shoot. His explanation is that he had been practicing his free throws so strenuously that the habit is difficult to break. The point, again, that I want to make, it is never too early to start a good habit. To develop a firm, stable disposition towards the good, to orient oneself to God. The second point is, it makes the doing of the good so much easier. And let us see, just in case one has started off on the wrong footing, it is never too late to reverse and shift gears. One point. <laughs> A precocious child <coughs> is supposed to have asked his father, when you and mom went to Italy for your honeymoon, where was I? <laughs> the quick thinking dad says, on the way to Italy, you were with me. But you came home <laughs> with your mom. <laughs> In 1981, when you were still with your dad, waiting for your cue, I started to teach what was then called Theology 21, Church and Sacraments. My world since then has been mostly the Ateneo and uh, with Ateneans. And over the past 25 years, I have made many friends or so I like to think. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I see some of them here. <laughs> I can see, as a matter of fact, I can see one from the 1992 batch. Perhaps there are some from other batches. But I am afraid I have also made a couple of hostile relationships. Maybe more than a couple. <laughs> Some of these fractured relationships I've been able to repair. Others, unfortunately, remain broken. Perhaps even bitter up to the present. Part of the reason is that I have not been a very forgiving and I seem to have a very retentive memory, especially of what I consider offensive and vexatious behavior. I look back and I realize that unforgiven offenses, fractured relationships, violated trusts, that winners, especially personal hurts, are such a burden of the heart. I would say now, with the benefit of hindsight, I say to myself, say to you, forgive, reconcile, restore, let go. It makes life so much easier. It makes life so much lighter. It makes life much more delightful. My message is, if you can forgive, forgive those offenses. Let go of those grievances. They are not as important as we first thought. By doing so, we will make our life easier and more enjoyable and our heart lighter. One point four. I am not a very pious person. And I am sure many of you would be eager to validate that. 
Nevertheless, <clears throat> I would like to assert that I think I'm still a religious person. And by that, I mean, and honestly, I mean this. God and His church and His teachings are important to me. And they are normative guidelines in my life. Even if Mr. Gaia of the Varsitarian <laughs> of the Pontifical and the Royal <laughs> and the Catholic University of Santo Tomas will probably disagree with vigor in another of his singularly misguided acts. <laughs> Now, while the person we create ourselves into is our sole responsibility, ultimately, we look to others for guidance. We look to others for validation. We look to others to assure us that we are on the right path. To me, sacred scripture, the moral guidance from the church, the rules of the Society of Jesus have been sourced of clear directions in my life. Now I bring this up because more and more often younger people identify themselves as agnostics, sometimes even atheists, and I am saddened, very saddened. The image I conjure in my mind is that of a person who detaches himself from his moorings, the moorings of his family, and sets himself adrift, left to his own devices to navigate the complicated and treacherous waters of life. Perhaps you might like to review your life directions. Perhaps you might like to reconnect with God. Perhaps you might like to rethink if it is really the Lord you want to get rid of, or is it some person identified with God or identified with the institutional church? They may seem like highly theoretical questions. They are not. The second of three parts. Things I would have done differently. This is somewhat related to the first. Had I learned the life lessons I talked about earlier on in my life, I think I may have done some things differently. Perhaps I would have gone about certain areas differently. I like to think of three. One, that is to say, 2.1. <laughs> In the days of my wasted youth, I seldom let anything pass. If I did not think it was right, I would, in the manner of a particularly tenacious variety of a pit bull, take issue with a person or persons concerned until I think the matter was set right. And to that the fact that I used to have a very short temper. In the process, I may have felt righteous indignation, perhaps even correct and justified, but I certainly antagonized a lot of persons and earned some enemies along the way. Looking back, there were things that even now I think I was right to fight for them, but so many of them much more than the things I thought I was right in, they may not have been worth the collateral damage. In one case, I even returned via LBC, a Christmas gift, a person I did not particularly like, gave to me. <laughs> because I think it was an empty and therefore a hypocritical gesture. Besides being expensive, I mean the LBC. 
<laughs> Looking back, perhaps I should not have done it. Perhaps I should just have let it pass. My point, choose your battles. Do not let yourself get sucked into minor and ultimately meaningless skirmishes. Some things are simply not worth your effort and perhaps even the enemies you will make. But if you're convinced it is an important matter, do not give a quarter, do not compromise, do not blur the boundaries of right and wrong, do not accommodate, do not lower the benchmark. But I would imagine these are not too many. You may find 2.2. <coughs> you may find this is strange thing for me to say. But you know, I should have studied harder when I was in first and second year college. I studied hard, but not hard enough. I think I could have done much better. I should have read more. I should have forced myself to do more. And I would have learned much more earlier. And I could have learned much more, much earlier than I was capable of do and that I was capable of doing more. But when I was first year, second year here, nineteen seventy my attitude then was, I was a provinciano, admittedly from the great metropolis of Bacno, <laughs> and that I was doing well enough, certainly for one from Bacno. <laughs> I almost set limits to what I could do. I must have thought to myself that I could not be better than my classmates from the Ateneo High School, or from Lourdes High School, where Mr. Calasans comes from. <laughs> he was, after all, our class valedictorian. I was almost, I almost canonized mediocrity. Hanggang dito lang ako. So I suppose I would say, do not set limits to what you can do. Do not fear pressure. Pressure and difficult situations are such a revelatory situations for you. Almost like sacraments in Thesis 7. <laughs> when under pressure you realize you are capable of so much more. The third of the second part. 2.3 My mother, may she rest in peace, warned me about many things when I was in grade school. I should not ride the Paris wheel because it is dangerous. I should not buy food from street hawkers. I might get hepatitis. <laughs> I may have taken too seriously a lot of those alarmist cautions. I think, as a result, I have been too conventional, hesitant to try out new things. I have always kept the rules. If I were a sailboat, I never ventured into the open seas. I have always hugged the coast as it were. In many ways, I was not too adventurous, always afraid to make mistakes. In this sense, it produced the expected effect. I did not make too many mistakes in my life, but I did not do many new things either. On the other hand, I did very little that was new or innovative because I was afraid. I preferred the tried and the tested. Up until recently, I used to write <laughs> with chalk on the blackboard until my hand got caught in the elevator and uh, 
I could not write with the uh, with my right hand for a long time. So uh, that is also why before when I was when I had to write with a chalk on the blackboard, it was essential that the picture before me ends promptly on time. And so uh, as soon as the bell rings, there I was staring down at the <laughs> But when I could not write, I took the careful, slow step. I said I will start with the overhead projector. <laughs> and I got stuck there. <laughs> I preferred, as I said, the tried and the tested. I was a consolidator rather than a creative innovator. If I were to live my life all over again, I think I would like to be more daring, more adventurous. I should not be terrified by the possibility of making mistakes. You are young, you can afford to make mistakes. Hopefully, not major mistakes, or I think the adjective in vogue now, not epic mistakes. <laughs> Hopefully not irreversible mistakes. That is the risk one should be willing to take. And with the benefit of hindsight, I say, I think it is worth the risk. Things I am grateful for. And if I had to start all over, I would live these aspects of my life exactly the same way. I think I would become a priest again. Only a kinder priest. <laughs> I think I would also join the Society of Jesus again. I think I would not mind being assigned as a teacher again. In the next life, if there is a next life, I think I would like to be an athlete. <laughs> However, I will not keep the ball like Terence Romero. <laughs> Though we are all glad he does. <laughs> I will slash and drive like Ryan Benafe. <laughs> I will twist myself like a pretzel in imitation of the layups of Kiefer Rovena. <laughs> I will bluff like Nonoy Baclau. <laughs> I will do a home run like Matt Laurel, even if we lost. <laughs> I will spike like Phil Kainlet. I will serve like Herbasho. But I will not regurgitate like Bring Us. <laughs> Obviously, I cannot compete with Kevin Ferrer. He's, he's like a... Uh, his tongue is so long. <laughs> almost hugs to the floor. <laughs> and if I will have to play for the UAP, I will not submit a falsified birth certificate like Dunsil and possibly Karim Abdul. <laughs> from the Royal and the Pontiac. <laughs> Without in any way intending to sound smart or complacent or self-satisfied, I have to admit I have much to be grateful to God for. And I also have a few regrets 
but I do not regret being born in the great metropolitan center of Pakistan. <laughs> I do not regret having become a priest. I am happy that I joined the Society of Jesus. And as I said, if I had to do it all over again, I will be a teacher. I have no regrets teaching 131, and I am glad I accepted Sergius' invitation to be with you this afternoon.